Good morning, church. Good morning. As we get settled and gathered here today, we just want to welcome you as we uh, find our way into worship. We're glad that you're here. I'm Kevin Lance, the pastor here at Steele Memorial Church in Barbersville, West Virginia. We're glad that you're able to join us, whether you are here in person or joining us on live stream. We want to welcome you. And as we begin, let's just uh, bow our heads together. Lord, in, in times of, of difference and division, in times of uh, heartache and confusion, save us, Lord, and help us focus ourselves on things that are excellent and worthy. Make us to be witnesses to your way of kindness and righteousness. Transform us and transform the world, we pray, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the way of announcements, keep in mind we're not simply uh, sharing things that uh, may have no connection with most of you, but we are sharing what's on our ministry plate, what we are doing as a church together, and uh, we want to uh, be sure that you are up to date and, and are, uh, are with us on a lot of those things. Today we have the joy of welcoming uh, Pastor Ed Grant and his wife Brenda and then their children, his son and, and daughter-in-law, Jeremy and Danielle, and grandchildren include Ella and Bryson, uh, all here together with some extra folks, uh, friends and family members. So we welcome you all. God bless you. I know you've been making your way. I didn't get a chance to talk to Ed because he was politicking around the building here. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just share that we are having our youth meeting this week, uh, Wednesday, the, our Wednesday night youth meeting starting back up from 6 to 8. I know they're planning on pizza uh, this Wednesday, so just uh, be sure and tell all those who are in, go, going into middle school and high school that uh, we know that uh, they'll be welcome uh, with Ashley Gallion as uh, she meets with those who are coming. And then in the way of our uh, offering, you know we're still not passing plates, uh, but we have our offering plates in several locations at the front, at the rear of the sanctuary, in the balcony, and in the overflow area. So we encourage you to take advantage of those. Um, you know, one of the ways that you can uh, share your givings, uh, if you're uh, still not here in present in person, you can mail a check. We've had a lot of our members and friends do that, and we try to keep that address posted for you from time to time. And then finally, on our uh, calendar, we, uh, our uh, Celebrate Recovery team met recently, and we're hoping to get started back up on August the 10th. Uh, Tuesday, August the 10th from 6.30 to 8.30 as we uh, get underway. You know, we had a, we had a great deal of uh, friends from the recovery community tell us how important that uh, this ministry has been to them uh, throughout the years. They felt so much love from a church. And uh, two of those who were at our leaders meeting uh, recently said that they didn't know if they would have been able to make it without this particular meeting at the church, the Celebrate uh, Recovery meeting that we host here. So just thankful for what God has, has done in our midst. As we begin today, we're going to uh, share together a call to worship, and the words will be on the screen behind me. Uh, I'll have the uh, top section, you have the bottom section as we make our way through a couple screens there followed by our song, O Worship the King. So will you stand with me? This is the day God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. These are the hearts and voices God has given us. Let us sing and praise and be joyful together.
say amen. 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 God bless you. We'll be seated together. I want to share with you in the way of our prayer concerns today as we think of the family of Jack Yeager. Uh, you know, Jack has had such a, a big presence in our community and among uh, his friends. A funeral service is today at 1 o'clock at Wallace Funeral Home. And uh, I know many of you will want to be a part of that. So keep that family in your prayers. And we also think of the family of Mary Alice Holbrook whose funeral we uh, celebrated her life on Friday. We think of her daughter-in-law, George Ann, and her grandchildren, Amanda, Benjamin, and Clayton. And uh, just want to surround them with our love and prayers. Uh, Mary Alice's son, Rock Holbrook, has been in the hospital and uh, had some, uh, uh, s some concerns that uh, have really made it... Uh, what made it difficult or impossible for him to attend the services themselves, but we want to remember him as well as Carl Eden, who was in the hospital this week, and Ron Walker, and also uh, Debbie Ours. Debbie's a friend of Kay Ratcliffe, and she's recovering from brain surgery and ex experiencing extreme headaches and, and nausea. We also think of Doris Wooten, who had a fall, She's a resident at the village at Riverview. And Amy Westcott, we want to continue to remember her. Uh, she's had chronic pain since the delivery of her baby. And uh, understand that uh, in August she'll go for a second opinion. And we pray that uh, God might open up a healing plan that uh, reveal that to those who are in charge of her care. So uh, let us bow our heads together as we join ourselves in prayer. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Amy. I, it took me quite a while to figure out where that was coming from. I heard the prayer concern, but Amy's upstairs and she shared that concern. God bless you. Any others? Yes, good. Okay. Thank you, Willie. George Ann. We certainly will. Good to see you and Clayton here today. Oh, ble bless you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are a God who never changes, and we come before you on this day to seek the change that only you can bring to our wounded hearts and broken spirits. We lift up those we have named and others we have left unnamed, remembering them before you, that you might bring your comfort and healing, that you will sustain us in the midst of our sadness, grief, and loss. From the bumps and bruises we receive through daily life, we come to this place and time to be transformed, cleansed, and healed. O oh God, who was and is and is to come, give us faith to become more fully the reflections of your love you have called us to become and breathe on us the breath of transforming life through the Holy Spirit of our Savior Christ Jesus as we gather in anticipation of your work in our lives that we might continue to celebrate your glory 
your goodness here in the land of the living so others might know you are an awesome God. It is in Christ's name we come. Amen. And let us join together in the prayer Jesus taught the church as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, today we have our uh, children's story at the front here. We have Skylar and Stephanie who are going to lead that. Any of the kids who want to step out, come on down. Good morning, everybody. Have you guys had a good summer so far? Yeah? Okay. Well, before we start today, I just want you guys to know we're going to have a little competition, okay? And the competition is who can listen the best. So you have to be really, really quiet because we have some great gifts up here, okay? All right. So today we're going to talk about how fair God is, all right? And today's Bible reading is called the parable of the workers. Have you guys ever heard of that story before? No? Okay. Well, in it, a man has to do work. He asks some people to do some work for him. Okay? And some work all day, and then some work just for a little tiny bit. But you know what he does at the end of the day? He pays them all the same amount of money, no matter how long they worked. And some of those workers who worked all day long really, really hard, they thought it was unfair. Do you guys think that that's unfair, that some people got paid the same amount even though they just worked for a little bit? Yeah, it's a little unfair, right? Okay, well, I can't take it any longer. I think it's time to give you guys a present, okay? All right, so I'm going to hand the mic to Scholar, and we're going to give it from who listened to the least to the best, okay? All right, we only have five gifts, so not everybody's going to get one. But it's okay. You might get one at the end. Okay, you go ahead. All right, fifth place goes to who? Peyton. It's a little rigged. <laughs> Stand up and show everybody what you won. A Nintendo Switch. So that's really good. Glad it was my kid so I didn't have to get it back. Who's this one? Um, number four, we've got... Ella, you got to show everybody what you want. Typical girl, takes her time, does it right. Show her what you want. Show everybody. She won a diaper. Yay. All right. Who's next? All right. Next up is number three. We're going to give this one to Savannah. An Elsa doll. Yeah, so that's good. Okay, number two. Now we're getting to the big ones. N number two, we've got Miles. <laughs> Toilet paper. <laughs> hey, that was a bit that would have been real big about a year ago. So that's that could have been good. And then our number one listener. And we know it's rigged. Goes to cruise. <laughs> and got a plunger. All right. So 
if that was our best listeners, was that, was that fair? The winner gets a plunger? I mean, that's good, right? No. Wasn't real fair. Like, some people maybe got better things than others and whatnot. Well, a lot of times when we do things, we, we kind of expect to get something better the better we do, right? Like, you win a tournament, you get a big trophy and whatever. But what God is teaching us in this lesson is that, is that everybody will get the same thing, Right? So he teaches us that he's not talking about winning a competition or talking about actually doing work, but he's talking about believing in Jesus. If we believe in, believe in God, and, and he, what he teaches is no matter if we're the, the best or the worst or if we've known, known him our whole life or we just met, or just learned about God, if we have faith, if we have faith in God, then, then we all get the ultimate prize. And you, all, you know what the big prize is? Get to go to heaven, right? So we all get the same prize uh, as long as we have faith. So now we're going to redo this, okay? We're going to redo our gift giving here. So who was the worst listener? Anybody think they were the worst listener? You can. All right, Cruz, Cruz, let's be honest here. So, the, 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 who's last is first, so you get a Tootsie Pop. Who is the best listener? All right, we got the best listeners over here. Come on. You get a Tootsie Pop. Everybody else, you can get a Tootsie Pop. And you got to ask your parents in case you have allergies or something. So, don't, don't eat it till you get back to your, to your pew. But... We're not finished. We'll just be real quick here. So what we're trying to, trying to teach you guys, or what we want you to remember, is that it doesn't matter if maybe somebody's not been really nice, or maybe they don't know about Jesus and they've, they've went a long time and haven't, haven't learned about him. It, it, none of that matters. It's never too late. You've never done anything too bad that Jesus, that having faith in Christ, that, that you can't still be the winner right? We all win the greatest prize of all, and that's getting to go to heaven and, and being with him. So let's uh, all bow our heads real quick, and we'll say a quick prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us Jesus so that we can all win the greatest prize. Amen. the children for Children's Church. And thank you, thank you guys for the uh, good story. As we prepare for our uh, preaching message, let's just join together in a chorus sanctuary. Thank you, Lynette. Last week, uh, as we are, we are making our way through the Gospel of Matthew, we heard about the story about the rich man who came to Jesus asking, what must I do 
to inherit eternal life. And Jesus answered him by quoting some of the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, and on and on. He named several of those. <clears throat> and after a little bit of back and forth dialogue, the rich man went away distraught because he couldn't give everything up in order to be perfect. Jesus then commented to his disciples, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that shocked the disciples. As Peter counted up all his merit points and had to ask, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Jesus answered, Everyone who has given up houses and family or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Now listen. In answering the question, what must I do to earn or to inherit eternal life, Jesus told the disciples, humanly speaking, it is impossible. And he meant it's, it's imp impossible to save yourself. But with God, all things are possible. And we talked about grace, that unearned reward that Stephanie and Schuyler shared this morning. And then Jesus uses a story to explain what that means and did you guys look ahead at the story I'm using today, Skyler? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I thought, that's really quite the draw we got here. And Jesus goes ahead to explain what he means about uh, uh, inheriting eternal life. The kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At 9 o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. And so he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work at, in the vineyard. At noon and then again at 3 o'clock, he did the same thing. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some people standing around, and he asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in, in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at 5 o'clock were paid, each received a full daily, uh, day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you've paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, Friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what, what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? And then again, Jesus summarizes. So those who are last now will be first then. And those who are first will be last. Now what's the truth or the lesson, the key point Jesus is trying to, to teach? First of all, God indeed is a very generous God. He gives you will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. A hundred times. Secondly, God is not only a generous God, 
but he is a sovereign in the way that he dispenses his blessings. Jesus told Peter, you will receive 100 times as much. And Jesus tells us in that kind of way, God is generous beyond anything you can calculate. We're going to focus on that first point. To make that point centuries before describing God's generosity, God spoke to his people in the Old Testament through Malachi in chapter 3, where he said, if you'll just quit robbing me, I will open the windows of heaven for you, and I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. I, I don't know if anyone has ever been at the jackpot, at the slot machines, and then probably shouldn't confess it right now, but can't you imagine so many blessings pouring out on you, you don't have enough room to haul it all in. The context in this verse from Malachi comes in the midst of God's anger. Earlier he would have said, ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. And so he speaks about their failure to obey and trust him by calling them robbers. And they respond, how are we robbing you? And God answers, in your tithes and offerings. Why do you think God's people failed to give and share from the wealth as required? Is it because Satan lies to us about God? Telling us that you don't need to give to God? God is, is not generous. You, you better not give God 10% because you won't have enough then to live on. God is taking this away from you. But now... The Son of God is teaching us that the Father is an exceedingly gracious God. So the landowner in Jesus' story obviously represents God, who is very generous. He goes out at different times of the day to hire workers for harvesting grapes. Why did the landowner go time after time? Jesus is making a point with the landowner who is God, going out to find people who have a need. They need to work. They were day laborers who literally needed a day's pay in order to survive and care for their families day by day. They lived on the margin and were only able to get by if they found work for the day. In fact, God had created a law a thousand years before that made sure the people were cared for. Written in Deuteronomy 24, we read, You shall not withhold the wages of poor and needy laborers. You shall pay them their wages daily before sunset because they are poor and their livelihood depends on them. And so the landowner keeps coming and keeps hiring. There are a group of men who have been in the town square the whole day when at 5 o'clock he keeps hiring with one hour left in the work day. Now, who in the world is going to come along and hire them for an hour worth of work? They face the prospect of not having anything for the day going home and not having the ability to feed their family the next day. But at 5 o'clock, the landowner comes and offers whatever is right. And the workers are hired for that one hour. And listen, God goes out to seek people in order to care for their needs. We call that grace. He is a seeking God to bring blessings to those in need. 
Now a coin of that day, the denarius, is a day's wage. There was also a coin for one-twelfth of a denarius. The last who were hired could have expected to receive at least some small portion of the day's wage, which is better than nothing at all. But you heard the story. Everyone receives a full day's wages. For the man who was hired in the early part of the day, who bore the burden of the work in the heat of the day, that was to be expected. A full day's wage was promised. It was agreed. But for those who were hired for one hour of work, why, that was extreme generosity. Why did the landowner do this? And that brings us to the key for our message today from what God brings in his word. The landowner gave according to what the men needed, not for what they earned. That's an important lesson. The landowner gave according to what the men needed, not for what they earned. And this is how God deals with you and me. He gives what we need, forgiveness of sin, everlasting life, not what we earn. And earlier he has said, it is impossible for man, but nothing's possible for God. Impossible for God. The Bible says, since we, he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Won't he give us everything else. So God's reward is not based on your work and effort. It's based on his grace and justice, his compassion for all of us. Now God didn't, God didn't take advantage of the eager worker hired at the beginning of the day. For those who have been a part of his church and have worked their whole life long, the landowner struck a bargain for a fair and agreeable pay. It was a very caring act. At the same time, when God pays a man more than what he earned, it's because God cares that the man would have enough on which to live. And it's an extremely gracious and caring act. It is not unfair to the first, to the earlier worker, it simply reveals God to be enormously caring. In fact, we find this compassionate expression of God everywhere in Scripture. With the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament, God speaks uh, about his chosen people. They will be my people, and I will be their God. That's Jeremiah 32, verse 38. But then listen to verse 41. I will rejoice in doing them good. God is talking about those who have done evil in his sight. If you go back and read verse 32 before we got to these pieces. God has hammered them for the many sins and failures. And yet, he will do them good. God was able to look beyond the time of their discipline or exile in Babylon to assure them they would be restored. In fact, he enjoys doing them good. He will have fun doing them good. And he will, he will rejoice in doing you good. When God blesses you, he is rejoicing and having fun. Why? Because God is a gracious and generous God. There should be an amen. <laughs> now we switch and we see, we've talked about his generosity, and let's talk about his sovereignty. God is not only a generous God, but he's also sovereign in the way he applies his grace. Have we talked about what it means to be sovereign in a while? Sovereignty describes an absolute, 
perfect power where there is no other challenge to his authority. God is accountable to no other. His is the last word, and he is perfect and compassionate. We've just affirmed he is generous. But still, we have to ask, how many of you struggled with the unfairness of the landowner? I mean, okay, so the last guy, he comes, he works an hour, shouldn't get what the other guy has. I mean, at least a plunger is, is enough. But who is it that doesn't think the landowner unfair? The ones who were hired at the last hour. They thought he was very, very generous. So why do we think the landowner is unfair? Because we're good people. Most of you would be like those workers who showed up and worked the full 12 hours and you feel God owes you a little bit more now. Remember what Peter said earlier, we've left everything in order to follow you. And Peter wants to know what he will receive. He feels like he has earned something a little more and when it's time to pay the workers, the foreman begins with the last workers picked. Now it's interesting to note that if he had paid the early laborers, or uh, yes, if he had paid the ones who had come at the beginning of the day and paid them first, he probably wouldn't have this problem on his hands with, with people complaining. But the whole time the foreman is passing out the standard payment for a day's wages to the late workers, the early workers were probably thinking, whoa, whoa, here, look at this. How, you see how much he's giving them? We've been here a lot longer than they have. They probably assumed they were going to receive so much more than what the owner promised. They were shocked when they received the same pay as everyone else. They've worked all day long, and the landowner has made the ones who worked one hour equal to them. The question was, raised by the son of a minister about his mother who had worked side by side with her husband in ministry all these many years plainly giving her life to serve the Lord in order to see that the ministry succeed and now here she was dying uh, of bone cancer which can be a very painful process and her son asked after all she's done for God this is the thanks she gets. The way he acknowledges her faithful work. God has let her down. God ought to come through. He owes her more than she's receiving. Now, <clears throat> he didn't really quite say it that bluntly, but that was the son's attitude. But don't we think the same in more subtle and polite ways? Where are you, God? Why haven't you rewarded our faithful zeal and our sacrifices? We wonder why God doesn't reward those whom we know to be faithful. Jesus describes the attitude of the servant as our role model. In Luke 17, he said, when a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of the sheep, does his master say, come on in and eat with me? <laughs> no. He says, prepare my meal, put on your apron, serve me while I eat, and then you eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. We're unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. The servant only did <coughs> what was expected. 
Now let's say you're issued a driver's license from the state of West Virginia or Ohio and you perfectly observe all the traffic laws of the state for a year. You stop at all the stop signs. You observe all the traffic lights and the right-of-ways. You always use your turn signal when changing lanes or turning at an intersection. You, at the end of this year, do you receive anything from the state acknowledging your faithfulness? No, because you've only done your duty. You have followed the law. I owe God everything. He owes me nothing. We've not, we've not been close to loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind as commanded. Suppose we did this. So suppose we love Him with our all. We've only done our duty. We are His creatures. We are under His law. We were created for His glory. God owes us for absolutely nothing. And we can never obligate God. Paul wrote on our behalf in Romans chapter 11, Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? Some, someone might argue, well, I've done this and I, I've done that. But where did you receive whatever you're giving? Where did you get the energy to serve so faithfully? The young man who was grieving over his mother's cancer after giving 40 years of her life devoted to God was asking why God couldn't spare her but from whom did she receive those 60 or 70 years of life? Have you ever been able to give God anything? The Bible teaches us that all things come from God, and of your own have we given you. Lord, what you've given me, it's yours and I give it back. Because I have nothing on my own but the blessing he has provided. And so we think about the final part of this scripture where the peril of comparing comes into place. We notice the early workers were grumbling not because they had been treated unfairly, but because someone else had been treated very generously. The earliest, the earliest ones who were hired received exactly what they had agreed on, the customary pay of the day. God was right to bless those people more than us, quite apart from what we're doing. He has a right to do as he wants. He's sovereign. He decides what he wants to do. It's right. Max Licato asks a compelling question. Are you satisfied with one gift? The gift of salvation for eternal life. Are you satisfied that Jesus saves you from the judgment that leads to hell? Are you satisfied with that one thing? And what if God only, God's only gift to you is His grace that saves you? Will you be content? And here we are, we may beg God to spare the life of our child. You plead with God to help you make ends meet. You implore Him to remove disease from your body. And it is right and good that we pray because He gives us that privilege. But what if His answer is, My gift of life is enough. Mercy and forgiveness if God did nothing more than save us from hell, could anyone complain? Having been given eternal life, dare we grumble at anything short of heaven? He is sovereign and he has the right to apply his grace however he sees fit. 
when you really recognize the extravagant generosity of God's mercy, it's a game changer. You stop focusing on what's fair and instead you humbly appreciate God's unbelievable kindness. Hopefully, you recognize what the early laborers missed. Working in God's field, I am my best self. So, are we going to grumble that we all receive the same? Or are we going to praise that we all receive the same? Why were the last treated like the first? And the first as the last? There may be no connection between the efforts you put in and the blessing you receive. Because God is an absolute, so he's absolute sovereign in dis uh, distributing his blessings. But remember this. Before we saw God's sovereignty, we saw his generosity. And may God help you learn to trust Him for His generosity and to accept His sovereignty and to not grumble and compare yourselves to others because God is apparently blessing someone else more than He's blessing you. And when you learn this, you can learn to be content. And will you bow your heads with me? And as we reflect on this, if you, ha if you haven't found contentment with the generous and sovereign God, will you draw near to Him, draw near to God and let Him love you and trusting Him to, you, to, to, to provide for your every need? <clears throat> you know, there's a word... That we, uh, that we rarely use for ourselves. Satisfied. <clears throat> and will you allow yourself to be molded by contentment in the Master's hand? We are sometimes doubtful, O oh God, that you are in the midst. This weary old world groans in pain. And we humans are too often enslaved by fear and suffering. And it's so easy to lose hope. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts and thoughts. And if there is any wrong in us, lead us in the way everlasting. And teach us your hope that shines even in the seemingly hopeless situations. Teach us, God, to celebrate your love even when darkness covers us like a cloud. We will believe in your generosity, your grace, and your love through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we close today with our music, and just know that the altar rail is always a place of prayer. It's holy ground for so many of you who have come to worship Him and to, uh, to receive what He distributes day after day after day. Again, if you want to pray here at the altar, you're welcome to do this. We're going to stand as we sing, He Lives.
Devin has asked me to share the benediction. It's a great to be here at Steele today and to see so many friends. Uh, I'll tell you, this church is so special to me. I, I rejoice. It's good to be retired. I can come back and <laughs> visit with you. But anyway, this is week two of retirement, so it's not that long. <laughs> and I'm sure Brenda will have something for me to do. But <laughs> anyway... It's great being with you. Will you join me in this prayer? <clears throat> we thank you, O oh God, for your generosity. We thank you, Lord, for how you just keep on giving every day of our lives countless blessings far beyond anything we can imagine. Thank you, Lord, for your generosity. Thank you for your sovereignty, that you are the God who is in charge. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for this church. What a blessing it is to be back here at Steele for this service today, and what a blessing it will be in days to come. And we ask, Lord, that you will go with all of us this day, keep us in your love and care, guide us, and Lord, watch over us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> 